Tēnākoto kato, welcome everyone. My name is Kathy Arrington. I'm the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation, Mahi Aroma. Uh, thank you for joining us and our partners at WSP New Zealand for today's webinar. Uh, we're joined by our patron, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, to discuss preventing the next pandemic. Um, if we couldn't have a better person with us to discuss this topic, um, if you were not already familiar, uh, public health has been one of the most long-standing interest areas uh, for Helen's career, right from her time in New Zealand politics through to the present day. Uh, most recently, Helen served together with Alan Surley, the former president of Liberia, as co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, a panel set up by the World Health Organization to review the global handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and our discussion today is going to cover some of the work and recommendations from that panel. The independent panel began its work in September 2020 in the thick of the pandemic and submitted its main report, COVID-19, Make It the Last Pandemic, to the World Health Assembly in May 2021. Um, it's a privilege to be here today with our partners at WSP New Zealand. Uh, WSP New Zealand and their support is one of the reasons that the Helen Clark Foundation is able to exist. They support a research position with us that does work into the future of New Zealand's cities. Uh, we are actually currently recruiting for that position, so if you have an interest in urbanism issues and would like to work with, with both of us, please do consider throwing your hat in. Uh, my colleague Grace will drop a link now to the job advertisement in the chat. Um, but without further ado, and before I explain a bit more of the substance of today's session, I'd like to hand over to Neil Barr, the Director of Property at Buildings at WSP New Zealand, to say a few words of introduction on their behalf. Over to you, Neil. Kia ora and, and welcome to you all. I understand over 300 members of the public, WSP clients, members of the Helen Clark Foundation. So what an audience today. Um, my name is Neil Barr. I am the Director of Property and Buildings at WSP here in New Zealand. I'm very pleased to have been asked to give a few opening remarks, not long, on this webinar on potentially preventing the next pandemic. Um, WSP has been partnering with the Helen Clark Foundation since about 2019. Um, providing research and evidence based into some of the critical social issues that, that we face. Um, we do sponsor a full-time fellow at the foundation and after and just hearing that maybe it's not been filled, I might put my hand up myself because I think it'd be a, a lot of fun um, to get involved and try and solve some of the wicked problems that the, the, the um, not just New Zealand, but globally are facing at the moment. We're also lucky as part of our partnership to be able to hold webinars like this, share thought leadership, and I wanted to take the opportunity to provide some comments on the connection between that built environment and potentially prevent the, the next pandemic. So the built environment has affected the transmission of infectious diseases and has evolved in response ever since cities first appeared. Don't need to look too far back in history to see examples of urban built environment strategies that, that were informed by infectious diseases. There were things called pest houses in the 15th century Italy. Um, and then with cholera and typhoid coming through, construction of city water and sewer systems in the 18th century, 19th century, to trying to reduce um, the transmission thereof. In fact, it was the architect and quite highly regarded urban planner Le Corbusier that said hygiene and health depend on the layout of cities. And that without these, the social cell becomes atrophied. So he could almost have been writing about COVID's impacts on, um, on the world's mega cities way back then. Several features of the built environment increase the risk of COVID transmission, and, and we know this, it's just we forgot about it for maybe 100 years or so since the last flu outbreak post First World War. Overcrowding, poor air circulation, um, and now we think about the future um, and what can we do differently going forward. We all know from our experience with COVID-19 that pandemics have had a significant implication um, on how people work, live, congregate, how businesses thrive, how buildings operate, how life um, continues with some sort of normality. And in our industry, the current pandemic has brought those questions um, right back to the forefront. It raises important questions for research and practice in urban planning and requires policymakers, planners, engineers, architects to think more out of the box with the, with the new constraints that we know about today, albeit they're not new for humanity, they've gone back 500 years. So with that, I wanted to thank you for attending the webinar today. And I really thank Helen Clark for being here. I hope you find it interesting and illuminating. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Neil. Um, before I kick into the substance, I'll just quickly run through how this session works and how you can interact with it. Because uh, the first thing to know is that this is not a normal Zoom call. Um, your camera is not on and your microphone's not on. So please don't worry if you need to make noise or look after your children, you're not going to cut us off. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. We very much do. Uh, if you look along the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A function and a chat function. Uh, please bring up the Q&A. If you'd like to see me ask Helen something, you can put your question in the Q&A. Uh, you can also, please bring it up even if you don't have any questions, because you can also like other people's questions and they'll go to the top of the list and it will be more likely that I ask them. Um, the chat function, which you'll also see, please don't put your questions in there because I won't be watching that consistently, um, but feel free to use it to introduce yourself to other attendees, uh, to um pull links out my colleague grace is going to put links in there to background information um and uh, feel free to use that to interact with other attendees at the webinar today but just to reiterate please don't put questions in there for the discussion because i probably won't see them um and yeah so i think that that covers off most of the practicalities so uh welcome helen and thank you so much for your time um we really appreciate having you here uh, I was wondering, just for those of our audience who are maybe not familiar um, with the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response, could you explain to us a bit about how and why that panel was set up and what did you identify as the key measures needed to prevent future pandemics? So uh, we'll all recall that we became aware of this virus very, very early in 2020. And there was a detailed chronology which was compiled for our panel with work led by uh, Dr. Sudhir Singh, uh, a Kiwi who was my uh, Sherpa for the panel work. And so if you follow that chronology, by the end of January, 30 January, there had been a public health emergency of international concern declared by the Director General of WHO. Uh, he then, by mid-March, used the terminology pandemic. That has no legal meaning, by the way, in the international health regulations or to WHO. But I think Dr. Tedros became so uh, so concerned that there wasn't enough action that he, he felt, in the light of what was happening, that he had to use that term. So in May each year, the World Health Assembly, which is the really the supreme governing body for WHO, had its annual meeting. And it was online because of the pandemic. And what it asked for in a long resolution on the pandemic was for Dr. Tedros, the Director General, to initiate an impartial, independent and comprehensive review of the international experience of WHO's coordination of response to the pandemic. Now, I think that probably when they asked for that in May 2020, they thought it would all be done and dusted within a year because we had to report back within a year. And uh, the rest is history. You know, we were only in relatively early stages of a vaccine rollout um, in some parts of the world by, by May 2021. So this was the origin of, of the panel, the World Health Assembly resolution. And then in, in July, uh, following up just a few weeks after that, Dr. Tedros asked me and the former Liberian president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who, who's an amazing and wonderful woman, uh, would we co-chair it? And clearly this was really <laughs> mission impossible to bring down a, a, a report that um, was useful in a relatively short time, but we, accepted and then by September we had a full panel in place and we got on and, and actually had a report ready to present to the World Health Assembly in May 2021 on time. So the, the key areas of our findings were that uh, the response you know, clearly wasn't good enough. I mean, that, that's the understatement of the year, but that's the gist of it. And, and for a, a whole lot of reasons, the alert system uh, wasn't uh, adequate uh, to uh, sound the alarm. Uh, the WHO lacks 
a lot of powers with respect to what it can and can't do uh, in response, and we can talk about that later when we get to details of reforms. Uh, you know, when the pandemic was declared, not enough countries took any notice anyway. Uh, so th th this was the gist of it, and we we said you need a, a substantial reform of the international and national architecture for pandemic response to do better in future. Uh, we proposed that a leader level global health threats council be established, uh, led by heads of state and government from around the world, and including civil society, uh, private sector, and, and eminent scientific uh, expertise just to keep the pressure on for mobilizing uh, around pandemic preparedness and response because the past history has been of a cycle of panic and neglect. And as we can see now, we're through the panic cycle, we're into the neglect cycle. And if we don't make some changes in the way we deal with it, we'll be back all over again. So, so this overarching governance monitoring oversight is, is very important. We did recommend dedicated financing uh, for pandemic preparedness response. Uh, we recommended uh, changes to the international health regulations and supported the negotiation of a new pandemic legal instrument. Uh, we had a lot to say about how to overcome the vaccine and other inequity in the future. Uh, and then we made some proposals for strengthening the independence of WHO itself. So that, those were the key the key measures, and you know, happy to go into further detail about any of them as, as a package of recommendations. What would you say was the greatest mistake that was made during the COVID-19 pandemic? So I think the greatest mistake was the failure of the world's nations to pay sufficient heed to Dr. Tedros's declaration of the public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January. Now, our panel was critical of the month before that. We are critical uh, that China did not allow WHO immediate access to the site of the outbreak. We are uh, critical that WHO didn't have the power to publish the information that it had. We are critical uh, that it didn't use a precautionary approach when it became increasingly clear that a respiratory virus with this kind of potential to kill uh, was, was afoot. And we're critical that the emergency committee of WHO, which Dr. Tedros was obliged to call, did not, when he first called it three weeks into January, agree to support this public health emergency declaration. So we're critical of all of that, and that we can make changes about that. But we can make all those changes if nations still refuse to take seriously a declaration of the highest kind by the World Health Organization, we're going to muff the next one. And so that's my plea. When WHO says jump, <laughs> you know, dangerous infectious disease with pandemic potential on the move, you jump. You don't mess around. You know, on the 28th of February in our own country, and we, we had one of the better responses, our Ministry of Health issued a statement saying the first case of COVID-19 has been detected in New Zealand and is not expected to lead to widespread community transmission. Were they dreaming? Were they reading anything? But as I say, we have in the end one of the better responses. Most of the, the world, including us really, uh, sat by and watched the the I think the things we did which were very important in February was we did stop travel from China and then from Iran because that's where the outbreak was was raging. Eventually, of course, as we know, we stopped travel from everywhere for two years except for those privileged to get a slot in quarantine. Uh, but you know, everyone was too late re reacting. So we lost the month of January because of poor uh, legal powers and procedures. We lost the month of February because nations didn't take enough notice of the declaration. Hmm. Now, our first audience question, it builds on what you you, you said just now, so I thought I'd, I'd bring it in. Um, is Did the WHO prepare any goals similar to the, uh, I think they mean the UN development um, goals uh, or the UNO sustainability goals uh, they've written uh, to cascade to member countries so that we know that countries are building more resilience in the future? 
Yes, in short, um, WHO has, has been piloting uh, an assessment of pandemic preparedness and response to enable uh, the world to have a better readout of, of what's actually happening because the indices which have been compiled in the past, like the one led by Johns Hopkins University and others, was clearly complete rubbish. It didn't take into account political economy for a start. And so that index, the latest version of it, released not long before the pandemic, uh, said that the United States and the United Kingdom in that order were the most resilient to health threats. <laughs> well, both had disastrous responses, but it was about political leadership. It wasn't about science and facilities. Uh, New Zealand was ranked 37th, by the way, and yet we ended up with the lowest death toll per capita in the OECD. Every death is a tragedy. The more you can minimise death, clearly the, the more desirable it is for, for yeah. families. But anyway, uh, so the WHO is, is now doing this, this pilot. It, uh, what I'm told is at the moment there's really rather too many indicators, there's too many of an obstacle course, but it should uh, ideally give a better, better readout and the idea is to have uh, a periodic peer review of countries' plans. Now, of course, many countries don't have a lot of resources for these plans. First thing you need to do now, if, if it's not already done, is do a full review of what your response actually was and where the gaps were. Norway's done that and as one of a number of countries, and they're taking a lot of lessons from it. When New Zealand reviewed it, its experience with SARS back in uh, the mid 2000s first century, uh, when I was PM, that led to our Epidemic uh, Preparedness or Response Act that was passed in 2005-06. And that was very useful. But we, we need a fresh set of learning, every country does. Mm -hmm. and, and then we need to fill our gaps. Now, not all countries have the resources to do that. And that's why the uh, Preparedness Fund, which is being set up, is very important. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one being established at the World Bank. But of course, because it hasn't been established in the right way, it doesn't have enough money. So it's got about 1.4 billion of the 10.5 billion it needs. But that solidarity money needs to be going to the Liberias and the Sierra Leones and other uh, least developed and low middle income countries to uh, be able to to get get their pandemic preparedness um, in in good shape. Um, so yeah, th things are happening. Uh, and I think you know, if we can keep the pressure and the focus on this, we could go into the next pandemic better prepared, but the jury's out on that. Well, that leads into one of my next scripted questions, which is, so So we've talked about the pandemic we've just been through, but where might the next pandemic come from? What, what are the risks on the horizon? The biggest risks are from the spillover um, viruses from animals to humans, what we call zoonotic uh, diseases. Uh, these, it's estimated that you know, anywhere from 60 to 75 percent of these emerging human infectious diseases are coming from, from animals. So, so what can you do about that? Well, it's what's called the One Health approach that's very important. It is about uh, uh, veterinary procedures, phytosanitary procedures. New Zealand's very strong on this, of course, in its, uh, in its trade trade rules. We don't just, you know, want to let anything come in. Uh, now, we live in a country where, you know, meat has to be, you know, properly killed in order to be uh, legally sold. But in many countries, these wet markets have, um, you know, not properly uh, slaughtered uh, animals and, and, and birds. And of course, with illicit wildlife trade, you have, you know, bush meat of various kinds uh, coming into markets and you don't know what's going to come from that and into a human population. And that, of course, remains, you know, a, a, a probable uh, source of where this particular virus came from. The debate's still raging on where it came from. But most of these kinds of diseases are from the spillover from animals to, uh, to humans. Uh, now, if you look more broadly at prevention, we as human beings are encroaching more and more on the natural habitat, on the forest habitat. And the more we're in that habitat and in close uh, connection uh, with its species, uh, then the more we're increasing the, the risks of spillover as, as well. Uh, it, I mean, it goes without saying that to minimise any, any risk of a, a threat emerging out of 
out of laboratories, you need very, very strict uh, safety precautions. And, and that's something that needs to be revised with, I think, with global protocols for the future as well. Mm. We've had a great question coming from Tim, one of our viewers, um, saying already some world leaders are encouraging their citizens to put the pandemic behind them. Um, and I mean, this, this is my comment, not, not Tim's, but you, you can understand that there's a lot of weariness with the pandemic. Um, people don't want to hear about it anymore. So how can we ensure that these kind of topics around pandemic preparedness remain in the mind of our leaders, especially when it's probably more politically popular to, to move on and not talk about it anymore? The trouble with just moving on is that all of us will know someone who's recently got COVID and has been very ill. You know, that, that's the reality. People are still dying of it. Now, it, it remains, you know, even with this sort of milder uh, Omicron variant, with its now 300 subvariants, by the way, it, it, it still, you know, re remains a, a disease which is more lethal than the annual flu. Uh, so for the long term, we need measures uh, around this disease. And I think, you know, leaders need to recognise this. You can't just say, well, we've turned the corner and that's that. And frankly, if leaders won't lead on it, if governments won't lead on it, if public health authorities won't lead on it, then it, it's up to citizens to safeguard themselves and their families. You know, people know that you know, I give a lot of support to my father, who's over 100 years old. We can't have COVID in the house. Uh, so... You know, whenever we're out and about, whenever I'm travelling, you know, we mask up. You know, carers come to the house masked up. We give visitors masks. So that's one of the most basic things you can do. I'm also a very strong proponent of vaccination. And I, I would say that you know, to anyone who's had just the two primary doses, you, you need to get your booster. For those who are eligible for your second booster, you need to get it. If you've had COVID, and you haven't had yet had the booster at the appropriate time after the interval of months has passed, you, you need to go and get it. So we, we need to take whatever steps we can to protect ourselves because as you say, um, authorities are now wary. You know, Publics are sick of it, but Omicron and uh, the virus generally is not, is not over us. And we can't rule out that there may be a, a more serious sub-variant or new variant come along which would uh, start uh, evading all the kinds of protections that we have. It's clear that Omicron can sort of whistle on through uh, vaccinations, but the virtue of vaccination is that you've got much greater chance of not getting uh, very, very ill. So, so, so that's my, my message. We, we just can't shrug our shoulders and say it's over because it ain't, and it won't be over. It's going to be around. It's, it, it, it's going to to be lurking out there looking for opportunities. Already you're seeing uh, in some places in the Northern Hemisphere, people start to talk about bringing back masking requirements for the winter, uh, where people are more indoors and, and it's more likely to be transmitted. Yeah. So one of the challenges during COVID-19 has been the lack of a glo a truly global response. Um, the, while there were efforts to create the COVAX facility to vaccinate the world, these had limited success and the Global North brought up the vast majority ultimately of vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. Uh, how can we stop something like that happening again? Well, what happened is, is really quite disgraceful. Uh, the reality is that the high-income countries you know, grabbed most of the vaccines ordered, in some cases three to four times as many as they needed, and then uh, didn't distribute what they didn't need in a timely fashion. Also, the uh, international facility that was set up, as you say, COVAX, uh, it, it didn't invest properly in capacity building. So you end up with you know, some vaccines getting out to developing countries, seaports and airports, but if you don't have the capacity then, to, to get it into a cold store chain and uh, have trained vaccinators to get it out to the furthest corners of the land, let alone your urban and formal settlements, then the vaccines don't result in jabs and arms. And that's why in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, vaccination still hovers below the, the 20% uh, level with many health workers and, and older people not protected at, at, at all at this point. Uh, so look, one doesn't want to be hypercritical of the facilities that were set up on the run. Uh, there was the what's called the 
ACT-IE, the Action for COVID Tools Accelerator, of which COVAX was the vaccine pillar. Uh, the other uh, pillars were supposed to help get out therapeutics and, and get out diagnostics, uh, essential supplies like PPE and, and oxygen. But of course, the North managed to you know, grab most of those as well. And you may recall around May last year, the terrible scenes from Delhi and other big cities in India of, of ambulances, people outside with no oxygen, dying in the ambulances, couldn't get into hospitals, no facilities, so disastrous. So what to do? Uh, our panel advocated the creation of a new end-to-end -end platform. And I think end-to-end -end will have some, some meaning to, to those in, in the technology sphere. So what we say is you need to build equity into the platform. You need at the beginning to bring a low and middle income country researchers into, into the research uh, consortium so that what is being delivered, for example, uh, with, with vaccines is uh, applicable in all country contexts. The mRNA vaccines, which require the super cold store uh, uh, facilities, aren't accessible to the poorest countries. They just don't have them. New Zealand had to invest in new uh, gear for that, and it, it's expensive. Uh, you know, se secondly, you need to be uh, then uh, bringing all this new IP, which is developed with public money, right? Pfizer, Moderna, and the rest of them are making zillions of profit off innovations which had huge money poured into them from the public purse of the US, the UK, and, and elsewhere. This needs to come into publicly available pools, the medicine patent pool, for example, of the, of the WHO, so it can be shared. Uh, you need to uh, support then uh, regional manufacturing hubs, and these are being set up now from South Africa to uh, Senegal to Rwanda, but of course if the IP, the knowledge and the technology isn't shared, they're limited in what they can do. Ideally, we need uh, the WTO to agree to what's called a TRIPS waiver, that's the uh, trade and related uh, aspects of intellectual property regime rate, waiver, so that uh, country companies can't protect this innovative IP, which is literally life-saving, but there hasn't been much a movement on this at the WTO. There was some kind of agreement uh, a few months ago, but it basically amounts to main sort of freeing up, if you like, some of the existing uh, procedures around uh, the technology rather than a complete waiver. They're supposed to come back next month at WTO to look at uh, whether some better procedures could be applied to the, the medicines which treat uh, COVID, like Paxlovid, which people are increasingly familiar with. So then you've got the money side of it, because one of the problems with this facility designed on the fly uh, was that it was, it, it did get some donations of drugs, of course, from, from Western countries, but it also had to purchase on the open market, but do it with the money that it could raise, you know, charitably, uh, whether through philanthropy or donor governments or whatever. And it just didn't add up. So we say that the model, whole model has to be designed for the um, development and allocation of global common goods. Mm -hmm. And what we would envisage with the financing facility, if it's to work properly, is it needs to be able to leverage up to 100 billion for the first 100 days response against diseases. And, and this you know, uh, access to uh, financing for vaccination could be part of that. So it's, it's quite a, a big package of things that needs to be done. It's all doable with political will. The question is how much there is around. I mean, we've had a question come in from Ruth that's quite relevant to what you were, were just saying. Um, you Related to these risks is uh, her question is, what have we learned about controlling mass disinformation as spread by social media, which denies the reality and risks of pandemics? Well, excellent question, because there's been what we call an infodemic around uh, COVID, as there is around everything now. Uh, with social media, and, and heaven knows how much worse it will get with Elon Musk now owning Twitter and not wanting any controls on on anything much. You know, the amount of disinformation can only accelerate. Uh, so the infodemic refers to both the fact that there's solid information, but also there's disinformation, and there's an awful lot of it. Now, 
in my opinion, as on many other topics, the social media networks have been far too slow to respond uh, to disinformation and to taking sites down. I mean, social media has created a kind of monster where, you know, most people use it for a good end, but some use it for a nefarious end. And, and sorting out the nefarious from the good doesn't seem to be something that the algorithms are, are terribly good at. So the best advice I think we can give members of the public is you need to follow authoritative sources. You know, you, you need to follow news outlets which aren't just headline seeking, but do seek the truth. I mean, BBC being an obvious example of it, they're not going to spread misinformation. They're going to report what they know to the best of their ability. You need to go uh, look at the sites for respected journals, like you know the British Medical Journal, for, for example. Or I follow on Twitter Dr. Tom Frieden, who used to be the head of the Center for Centers for Disease Control in the USA. So be very careful who you're getting your information from. Is it from a peer-reviewed journal? Is it from a reputable news source? Because otherwise, you'll find, and unfortunately, you know, a number of our fellow citizens around the world have been subject to this, people go down a rabbit hole of misinformation, conspiracy, and fake news, which leads even to questioning whether the virus exists. Um, yeah, that, it's very true. We've had several questions come in along the, those lines about the infodemic and, and the impacts of social media. And I, I mean, that link, links into one of my scripted questions, which was, what do you think are the best things we can do right now as citizens to make sure we do better next time a threat like this emerges? Well, as I mean, I think it, overall, you know, governments were the problem at the outset. Uh, not citizens. I mean, as citizens, you know, we're all watching the news and thinking, my my goodness, you know, what is going on? I remember uh, being uh, in the United Kingdom watching TV in late January in uh, 2020, and every night on TV there, we were seeing these horrible scenes from from Wuhan in China with you know, very very sick people, people in full PPE, but you know, there was no really serious message being conveyed at that point that this might not just happen in China, it might jump national borders and actually already had, uh, as, as, we, as we now know. So what I would say as citizens is just keep an awareness of, of, what's, of what's happening. Be prepared to act maybe even before your government uh, reacts. And what, what we now know, for example, about masking, is what well, we're starting to learn in New Zealand and Western countries what has been common practice in Asia for decades. I remember first going to Japan and seeing everybody with these masks on. It was very unusual. Well, we now know the point that, you know, if you live in, in, in mass society where you're sharing public transport and public spaces, if you even have a cold, you know, should you be coughing and spluttering over everybody else? Obviously not. So I think as citizens, uh, next time a threat emerges, and, and even if you're not feeling so well now for any reason, you know, wear that mask, sanitize your hands, you know, sanitize where you've touched, take the precautions that, that you can, because the there may be a lag in the kind of health warnings you're going to get from, from health authorities. Mm. And when do you think it will end, the pandemic, as we have experienced it, the, the COVID-19 pandemic? What, what would you say to that question? I think this is a, a really hard call for WHO. Uh, you know, how, how do you call an end to a pandemic when the you know, cases are still accelerating around the world? Um, I mean, I'm sure WHO feels under pressure to give people some light at the end of the tunnel. And at you know, some time it may see, say, look, it's an ongoing concern and here's how you need to manage it. We have to move on. Uh, but as I say, it, it's not going to go away. You know, we're going to go to our graves, <laughs> however old we are, uh, with this virus being around in some form. One of the issues is whether we will get the investment we need in, an, in new generations of vaccines, which will be more effective at preventing transmission. And the original vaccines were not designed actually to prevent transmission. They were designed to stop people getting very sick. Uh, so we need better vaccines. One of the problems of entering the cycle of pandemic and neglect 
is that it may take the pressure off to keep investing in the best vaccines possibly available. Because what, what we want really is to be able to have vaccines and know that you know, there's a reasonable chance we're not going to catch something. We don't have that at the moment. You know, it, it, it's breaking its way through four vaccinations <laughs> and and not just once. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the big issue for, for me. Can we keep the pressure on to keep the research and innovation both on vaccines and on treatments and diagnostics? What do you make of the proposed pandemic treaty? Uh, can you give us a bit of explanation for our audience uh, as well about what is the proposal, uh, just in case some people might not be aware of it? There's two things going on in the World Health Assembly circles. One, and I, I think this is really where the major emphasis should be, is a new review committee has been set up uh, to look at the international health regulations. And our panel was quite clear on where it thought the regulations were deficient not giving WHO the automatic right of access uh, to the site of an outbreak. It doesn't have that, so governments can obstruct. Uh, it doesn't have the right to publish information without a government's permission. You know, it needs to have the right to publish. It needs to have the clear power to call, make a judgment call in a precautionary way uh, that here's a, you know, a respiratory virus that's likely to spread fast or another kind of virus likely to spread fast. But at the moment, it's having to wait for you know, all the I's to be dotted and T's crossed. You can't wait for something like this is on the move. And then uh, the emergency committee is, is too politicised and the director general really needs to be empowered, of, of course, to consult, but, but then to move. You know, you're not, if you can't get consensus, just move. Because every day that a fast moving uh, lethal virus is on the move is a day when more people are going to die from it. So the IHR need to be tightened a lot. A number of countries have put proposals on the table uh, for what that could look like, and some of those are actually pretty good. Uh, when the new review committees looked at those, then the World Health Assembly will start negotiations. And the idea is to have a fresh set of regulations ready for ratification in 2024 in May, which is not speed of lightning, but it seems that's the way things are these days. Now, also parallel to that, there's an intergovernmental negotiating body which is looking at what a new legal instrument might look like. They're not even using the term treaty or convention now. And I suspect a reason for that is that, of course, if you say treaty or convention, that requires ratification in the US Senate. And they don't ratify international treaties anymore. <laughs> Never ratified convention on the rights of people with disability or convention on the rights of the child. So what chance this one, you know, with the, the remaining Trumpian influence in the, in the Senate. So this new legal instrument will probably be somewhat overarching. Mm -hmm. uh, it will express good intentions. It will probably be short of binding. It may say some useful things. It may say it may want to include reference to some of these new initiatives, like a new uh, platform for allocation of the global common goods, like vaccines. It may want to include reference to the financing facility. It might want, want to include reference to governance, although we don't particularly favour that because we don't think the new Global Health Threats Council should be seated in the WHO mechanism. So this is bigger than that. Uh, they're saying that equity should be at its core, but what does that actually look like in the end? It may end up being sort of aspirational and not very binding, but on the other hand, useful to have to remind people of the importance of fighting pandemics. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had a lot of audience questions come in on a wide variety of topics. Um, uh, starting with this one from Hayley, um, she asked if you could comment on long COVID, um, saying that... Uh, you know, it's well documented that people are falling through the cracks as a result of the serious impact of long COVID on their health. Uh, it's been repeatedly termed a mass disabling event. Uh, what do you think needs to change in regard to our response to long COVID? Well, it's, it's a very serious uh, issue. And I've referred to you know, the deaths from COVID, which of course are, are staggering globally, you know, in excess of 20 million uh, in all likelihood. But uh, the numbers of cases of long COVID, uh, I, I would expect, would you know, far exceed that. And you know, I personally know, you know, a, a young person whose heart and lungs have been deeply damaged by long COVID. Uh, so it can be extremely serious, and no doubt there will be those 
online with us today who in one form or another are experiencing of, of either with serious damage to vital organs, the heart, lungs, kidneys, or with extreme tiredness or you know, a range of other uh, conditions associated with long COVID. So I suppose if we go back to basics, the best thing remains to try to avoid getting COVID. Uh, so, you know, those basic public health precautions like masking, physical distancing, just situational awareness, I suppose we could say, as well as keeping up to, with, to date with vaccinations. But then I would suggest that our health authorities need to be abreast of the very latest research on long COVID, uh, on what the therapeutics are that can deal with it. Uh, don't also dismiss the reality of post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, people who are so damaged by this disease, are, are, you know, can, it can be absolutely life life changing. So people need quite a wide range of support. You know, is, are our you know social uh, security mechanisms up to supporting people with this medium longer term? You know, we we just need to have a good review of how we're supporting our people uh, to you know be right on top of this. So, you know, full full empathy with everyone experiencing a long COVID. And thanks to Ian Town, I think is a scientific uh, advisor at the Ministry of Health, who's, who's putting up now uh, the clinical guidelines in our chat box on uh, what the Ministry of Health is doing around this. And, you know, full marks to them. Mm. Um, we've had a question come in about international travel. Um, the, these were some of the most effective, but also some of the most controversial regulations that were put in to control the spread of COVID-19. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on, on that. Are there new strategies to consider for how to prevent future pandemics, how we regulate international travel? One of the uh, problems with the international health regulations is, is they're not really very supportive to countries who restrict uh, travel. And I think that's because they're drawn up in 2005, the latest version, uh, before anything like the era of mass tourism that we see today. Chinese weren't travelling en masse, uh, for example, Chinese middle class in 2005. So we're all, well, most of us, much more globally connected than, than we were. And countries have to have the right to uh, control their borders by whatever means they, they see as appropriate. And, and it may be that you know, if a more deadly uh, variant of COVID comes along, uh, if another uh, you know, deadly virus, which is very transmissible, comes along, that the countries will want to go back to a stronger border measures. Ours all seem to have, have gone now. You're not required to take a test when you arrive back on day zero. Obviously, the quarantine's gone and, and you're not required to be vaccinated to enter New Zealand. But you know, the, there are tools that governments may have to call on again in the future. I think there'll be reluctance to go back to quarantine. But um, if, if these more adverse developments came along, I, I think it would be irresponsible not to be looking again at vaccination certificates and at uh, testing requirements around arrival. Mm. Um, Judy has asked um, that ageism has surfaced in the way that countries have responded to this pandemic. Um, what do you recommend to deal with, with that? I mean, just can you comment on that generally? Yes, yeah, so I'd be interested in the Human Rights Commission looking at this because I think the degree of ableism and ageism has been quite disturbing. There's, there's almost, a, oh, well, they were in their 90s, weren't they? Or they were in their 80s or the 70s. Hang on, you know, life ain't over. We all know we're going to die of something. But we don't need to die of an infectious disease whose transmission we could work a lot harder uh, to prevent. So, yes, it has been concerning to see people kind of shrug and say, oh, well, you know, look at who's dying. It's the old people. I mean, I, I just can't accept that. I ask, you know, what's happened to our humanity? What's happened to our sense of values? Uh, and to, you know, everyone who, who doesn't want any restriction of any kind, I just say, you know, do you want your relative who has health vulnerabilities, disabilities for whatever reason, do you want them to be in the firing line of something which could have been prevented? Um, so uh, another question from Sarah saying, um, with the emphasis on the need for a one health approach to prevent and control the risks of the next pandemic, uh, how can 
regional or national frameworks facilitate this, um, especially providing mechanisms for integrated surveillance, so human, animal, plant, environment. Do, do you have any comment on that? Well, I mean, One Health is something I'm not myself terrifically briefed on. I, d I don't have a background in the, in the biological uh, animal sciences, uh, but our report made the point that there has to be much more coordination between uh, these, these different disciplines and, and arms of, of health regulation and control. And again, you know, in, in the fullest time in New Zealand, we might want to, you know, pay a, a little more attention to uh, to that ourselves. I mean, you know, we're usually, you know, I think we can say reasonably world leading with respect to the control of animal disease. We go to an enormous amount of trouble to, um, to, to, to stamp them out and to be, you know, sure that people are, are, are aware. Um, but, you know, no one's perfect. So just, just be conscious that it's these events, these, these illnesses that are coming from animals to humans that can really blindside us. Mm. How much progress has there been? Oh, you made these recommendations in May 2021 from the panel. How much progress do you think has been made towards them overall? I think the panel has been very influential in uh, setting an agenda for what needs to be addressed. Uh, WHO uh, set up a um, sort of group itself to go through all the recommendations, not only of our panel, but there's various other initiatives. The G20 had one on sustainably financing preparedness and response. The uh, European uh, uh, regional organization of WHO had a, another commission which went a bit wider, but also had uh, relevant uh, content and recommendations. There's been the Lancet report, ver various reports. So they've gone through them all and sort of drawn up lists of the things that need to be done where they need to be allocated. So clearly the international negotiating body for the new legal instrument is, comes out of this, so does the uh, call for the overhaul of the international health regulations, so does the pandemic fund at the, the World Bank come out of this panel in the G21. As I said, we would have liked a different design, but that's a longer story. Um, one important recommendation that was picked up was on negotiation for the WHO budget. So we made the point that WHO needs to be more independent and have more long-term strategic financing. And only 16%, one six percent of its base budget, uh, last time it was negotiated, was funded by member state direct contributions, assessed dues, as it were. Now, we recommended that be lifted to two thirds and that the remaining one third be raised by uh, an organised um, you know, re, uh, refurbishment of, of the fund, um, replenishment. So the negotiators at World Health Assembly got going and led by a very forward leaning German diplomat, Jörn Kummel, uh, managed to get agreement to lift the base funding from 16 to 50 percent, which is not quite as high as we recommended, but it's a huge improvement. Now, it's going to be phased in and it could take as long as eight years, which is a bit unfortunate, but uh, you know, WHO will be better funded and it needs that to be in a longer term strategic and independent. Otherwise, it's going cap in hand for particular programs uh, to, to get one off um, contributions. So that's been picked up. Now the two areas that still need a lot of work is, is this end-to-end -end platform for the development and allocation of, of global common goods. There's been a, quite a warts and all evaluation done of the ACT A and COVAX facilities, and that points in the right direction, pretty similar direction to what we said. It's just not clear at the moment uh, where this will be picked up in the, in the system. Uh, and secondly, the governance aspect, the Global Health Threats Council. There's a number of reviews, including ours, which have recommended this in recent years. We think it shouldn't go in WHO, although WHO would like to have it in its constitution. I think it needs to come out of the UN General Assembly process, which is more overarching. There has been agreement to our recommendation to hold a high level meeting at the UN General Assembly next year, which would agree a political declaration, which set, should set the direction for the overarching uh, reform process. And we obviously would like to see a reference to both the platform 
end-to-end uh, -end platform and the governance structure on that. So a, a lot is happening. It's happening at different paces in different places. The WTO and the, and the TRIPS um, uh, waiver issues are obviously still, still current. Uh, could do much better, but there are processes under a dynamic new director general. So you know, let's not be discouraged by this, you know, but you have to keep the pressure on. And despite the fact that it's now over, well, some 18 months since uh, we presented our report, uh, President Sirleaf and I have kept going. We issued an 18-month uh, accountability report, uh, sorry, a, a six-month accountability report and a one-year accountability report. We hope to get another one out before the end of the year, actually. And it's all about just keeping the focus on it. Our last report was titled Transforming or Tinkering. <laughs> you know, is there really transformational change going on? But you know, overall, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that things will be better. Mm. We had a question come in from Judy asking, what links are emerging in your view between climate change and the spread of pandemics? This comes back to the issue of primary prevention. If we're uh, you know, standing by and seeing our great tropical forests, for example, falling to loggers and cattle ranches and soy farmers and the rest of it, as has been the case in Brazil. And thank heaven Lula seems to have squeaked in with the election today by the narrowest of margins, but a win's a win, as they say. Um, no, our, our encroachment on the tropical forest has been quite disastrous, uh, with a high risk for uh, zoonotic spillover diseases. Remember, Ebola has come out of the, you know, the forests as, as, as well. Um, so, yeah, primary prevention, what we do to uh, conserve our tropical forests will be positive for our health. You know? <laughs> it may seem like a long bow, but in the end, everything's connected. So preserve our forests, preserve the habitat for uh, unique wildlife, uh, preserve our catchments for rain and supporting the climate ecosystem, uh, avert against um, you know, mega events down downstream because of loss of forest and look after human health. It's got to be a no brainer, really. Mm. So we've had some questions coming in asking if you could comment about New Zealand. How's New Zealand doing? I'm sort of merging multiple questions together to, to ask this one, but could you comment a bit about, you know, there's a, it's a moment of change for the New Zealand health system, creating the public health agency, the national public health service. Um, and what, what, what should New Zealand be thinking about uh, as, as we you know, build these new systems? Well, I think, with reforms and, and the, the, the big structural reforms, the key thing is not to throw any babies out with the bathwater, you know, because things can fall through cracks. So you need to uh, make sure capacity is retained and, and in all honesty, probably built up as well. You know, we, we went through you know, nine years of bad underfunding of health, and it seems now that, you know, however much our current government is throwing at health, people say not enough, not enough, not enough. I've been Minister of Health, so I know there's never enough, but you know, every, every cent you know, needs to be spent wisely. And I think what the pandemic has reminded us is that uh, the very best investments you can make are in public health prevention and primary health care. You know, if a stitch in time saves nine. If you can prevent the spread of disease, that's going to save an awful lot of downstream misery uh, for, for families. Uh, and also for you know, the burden it places on the hospital system, which has been quite quite large, even in a country with you know a, a better record on COVID than many. Uh, so yeah, just uh, don't don't drop our guard on this as we go through these complex reforms. Is my advice. Mm. So we're coming to the end of the webinar now. We've got about five minutes left. So if you have any final questions, please do put them in now so that there'll be a chance for me to ask them. I apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. Um, but yeah, if you have any last thoughts, now's the time. Um, so the, the next question um, has come in asking, and this I think builds on this idea of what systems do we need for the future. Um, social networks are crucial to understanding how infectious diseases spread, and yet there's no real routine attempt to measure this. Um, uh, how can, can we uh, in, ensure that medical records capture this information, uh, which could be useful for a variety of health and social service planning? 
Um, so you, could you comment on that, on the, the how, can we collect better data? Um, is it meaning better data, particularly around the spread of a virus and so on? The yeah, on social of... networks. Um, yeah. It's the top question there in the Q&A. So it's quite a long question, but yeah, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. I imagine privacy concerns would be would be top of mind there, but it's, yeah, it's certainly we've found with contact tracing, we had to build systems to collect that data on the fly. Yeah. Well, I, I think a concern I would have now is we, we really don't have a clue how many cases there are. It's, it's all projection of the small number of people who uh, who bothered to report a, a test. Um, so, you know, I think we, we have gone from, from one extreme to the other, really, and I'm, I never think that's, that's desirable. For example, I just came back from offshore on, on um, early hours of Friday morning. Now, there's no longer a requirement to do a day zero test. There's no longer a requirement to do a day five test. Um, they say, you know, do it if you're symptomatic. But of course, if you're heavily vaccinated, you may have no symptom that causes you to think you may be a carrier. You, know, you might just think it's a light cold you've come off just about any flight with. You know? So uh, I, I am concerned that we're just not asking for and, and collecting sufficient data. But then switching over to the social media issues, uh, of course, the Helen Clark Foundation did one of its very early reports uh, on, quote, anti-social media, uh, saying that you know, a lot of what's on it is anti-social and, and proposed a form of bespoke um, regulation. Uh, we do regulate print media uh, through the voluntary means of the New Zealand Media Council. We do regulate broadcasting media through the Broadcasting Council. Now, somewhere in between there is a model which we advocated, which uh, you know, would would encourage uh, social media networks to take more care with with, with the content that they allow on, online, in, in order to try and avoid the spread of you know, outright disinformation and without you know impacting on on free speech, which is you know, responsible and fair opinion, as it were. Mm. So yeah, and the, the globally, there's a lot about to shift on on content regulation. I thought I just said. There, um, I, I worked on that initial report that, that Helen mentioned, and the um, it's soon Britain is likely to bring in the Online Safety Act, and the the European Union is likely to bring in the Digital Services Act that are going to really move the dial on on this conversation. I think I think we've all learned to realise that the, the reach of social media is so enormous that we can't we can't dodge these questions anymore uh, of, of regulation and, and globally we need to cooperate if we're going to rein in countries I mean 1.6 billion people use Facebook every day we're, we're talking of true goliaths uh, and uh, the corporates operating in this space so New Zealand alone we, we, we wouldn't be able to do much but if we move in step with these big players who are starting to move I think there is a lot of hope to to, to have some impact but New Zealand will need to think hard and be nimble and, and try and get in on some of those bigger players so that we have a hope of enforcing uh, what, what we come up with. And there, there is a content review underway um, being led by Minister Jen Tineti looking at some of these issues. So uh, if, if you're interested, I suggest you look up the, the content review on the DIA website and um, you can get some more information about that. And so we are, we are coming. Kathy, Kathy, did you not also write a blog on this from the recent oh. study? I did. So if you look at the um, the Helen Clark Foundation website on the publications page, you'll see that the most recent one is a, a, a blog I wrote on some of these issues. So um, please do check it out. Um, uh, unfortunately, we are now coming to the end of today's session. Um, so I'd just like to close off by thanking firstly Helen Clark for your time. Um, it was wonderful to get your insights from a person of your expertise. Um, and uh, I see Neil has has come back from WSP and that, there's a good prompt to just thank again WSP New Zealand for the support of the Helen Clark Foundation. They allow us to hold events like this and make them free and open to the public, uh, which is really important to us to bring senior perspectives from around the world uh, on these big issues of the day and make them available to the New Zealand public for free. So thank you WSP for helping us do that. And um, Neil, would you like to say any final words? Well, it's just a fascinating subject, isn't it? And the depth of knowledge from, from Helen based on your your past few years in the 
higher echelons of global society um, is 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 wonderful to have your perspective here in New Zealand. So thank you very much, Helen. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Neil, and thank you, WSP, because we've had a you know, really great partnership with you going for for quite some time, and uh, it's it's really great to see so many have joined and terrific questions. Um, I've asked Grace to put Kathy's blog up on the anti-social media um, uh, stuff if she can. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll just keep batting on to um, uh, on the global reform process and and hope that you know with the leadership of Ian Town, who's been online for Minister of Health and others, that you know we'll keep getting a, a, a quality Kiwi response to all this. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll leave the blog. We will leave the webinar now. Uh, but for those of you who want to get some of those links out of the chat, my colleague Grace will leave it running for a minute or two, so those links will stay active. But uh, the speakers, we're we're all going to leave the session now. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, if you're interested to support our work, please consider becoming a member of the Helen Clark Foundation. Um, it's only $35 a year and it makes a real difference to what we're able to do. So thank you again and hopefully see you next time.